maintaining the peace treaty in is, uh, with Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, at least, what we've seen is that in some cases they've said the right things and taken the right steps. Uh, in others, uh, how they've responded uh, to various events may not be uh, aligned with our interests. Uh, and so I think it's still a work in progress. But certainly in this situation, what we're going to expect is that they are responsive to our insistence that our embassy is protected, our personnel is, is protected. And uh, if uh, they take actions that indicate uh, they're not taking those responsibilities, as all other countries do where we have embassies, I think that's going to be a real big problem. All right, Cliff, you're a lot brighter than me. I'm Captain Obvious on that one. Tell me, what did that mean? Uh, look, I'm not going to be harshly critical of that statement. I'll tell you why. On the one hand, Egypt has been for years a recipient of billions of dollars of aid. On the other hand, right now, they have a government. Yes, it's democratically elected, but it's a Muslim Brotherhood government. And the Muslim Brotherhood is ideologically committed to something we should find reprehensible, the idea of Islamic supremacy in the world. And we also just saw... Uh, riots at the, uh, on, on the anniversary of 9-11 uh, in Cairo, the storming of our embassy, the tearing down of our flag, and the putting up of what is essentially an al-Qaeda flag on the roof. And the Morsi government did very little to prevent that or try and stop that and didn't apologize. So I don't see how Obama could say, yes, they're an ally. I don't see how he could say, no, they're clear, clearly not an ally. I think he had a kind of hedge and haw, and that's what he ended up doing. Is that because, and I absolutely appreciate you giving the response you gave, because as we look at it, we say, all right, here's the situation we're in. But we're in the situation not overnight. Here is President Obama. Mubarak has to go. Uh, then we have the Muslim Brotherhood, a uh, largely secular organization, right? Uh, so, Cliff, tell me something. <laughs> I'm, 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 it's a bit of just pointing out the absurdity of it, but President Obama's actions are in part what got the Muslim Brotherhood in power. Well, so what does he do now? Crane, you're, you're right, and, mm. and let me go a little further than that. We do not have a coherent set of policies in regard to what we now call the Muslim world because we don't have, at the highest levels of this government for sure, and I would say previous governments, a clear understanding of what's taking place in the so-called Muslim world. Unless you understand it, you can't have policies to address it. And what we have very simply is the rise of a movement, and I would call it Islamism, and that movement is totalitarian, and it is dedicated to Islamic supremacy, the same way that Nazism was dedicated to Aryan supremacy, the same way that communism was dedicated to the supremacy of the proletariat. And we need to have a posture and policies to deal with this problem, because some of it is terrorist, and that's we and like Al Qaeda, some of it is what we see in Iran. That, too, Iran is an Islamist, jihadist, revolutionary, global revolutionary government. Uh, and some of it is institutional. There are plenty of Islamists who think, look, if we can be elected through the ballot box, we should be. But if we can't be, we have other means. I would say that's what's happening in Libya, which is a different situation than Egypt, where you had the Islamists clearly voted down. And they said, well, that's fine that we were voted down, but we have other things we can do and other means to, with which to do them. And part of that was going after Americans and killing them. How would you advise President Obama to respond to specifically the death of an American ambassador? I realize that with your history of covering Iran uh, and the revolution there and Carter, Carter experienced the death of the Afghanistan uh, ambassador, if I'm not mistaken. So... I, I'm seeing similarities. I'm wondering, as you look at history, you can maybe walk us through, because if you understand history, you probably know what's going to come up next. So how should he have responded? Well, in terms of Libya, I think he's still responding. Look, we need very good intelligence. When these groups are planning acts like this, we should, we should know about them if we possibly can. But we should also be going after these groups at all times, wherever they are. And when we find these groups and find these terrorists, we need to capture them or kill them. We need to be doing and we need to do something that Obama really doesn't want to do: capturing enemy terrorists who are plotting acts of terrorism or war against us. And when we can capture them alive, we need to interrogate them so we get further information. And we're not doing that at all. And that's one of the reasons we're not getting the kind of intelligence we need. We should have, frankly, our intelligence should have known that these things were coming. I'm sorry that that didn't happen. But again, if you're not doing human intelligence. It's, it's hard to do. We have to go after our enemies. We cannot sit back and wait till they strike us and then say we're going to bring them to justice. This goes back all the way 
to the 1990, at least, well, it goes all the way, at least back to 1983, when Hezbollah, which is associated closely with Iran, bombed our embassy in Beirut, killing more Marines than had died at any incident since Iwo Jima, and we never did anything about it. And in 1993, we prosecuted individuals who were responsible for the first attack on the World Trade Center, but no organizations, no states, nobody higher up. And by the way, that's still going on because we have an individual, the blind sheikh, who's in prison right now in the U.S., and they are demonstrating in Egypt saying we should release him. He's an Egyptian hero, and Morsi has actually asked that he be released as well. So we don't get rid of these problems by pretending that they'll go away. They don't. They won't. It's not going to happen. We have to start to understand what is going on. We are not fighting a war against all Muslims in the world. In fact, in Libya, which you have seen recently, and this should be more in the news than it is, are the Salafi jihadists, the extremists, the Islamists, call them what you will, blowing up the shrines, mausoleums, and mosques of the Sufi Muslims because their tradition of Islam is different and is more pacific and is more tolerant, and so they're going to kill them and they're going to force them out. There is a war going on against Muslims within the Islamic world, too, by the Wahhabis, the jihadis, the Salafis. Again, there's a lot of terms, but the extremists, the bad guys, are fighting us, but they're also fighting within their own world. Now, I wish I could say there were a lot of moderates standing up to these guys, but part of the thing that moderates don't do is stand up. They don't have guns to fight back with. So do we need to arm them? The, look, I don't think the, 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 the Sufis of, of, of Timbuktu or the Sufis of Libya are, are going are, are gonna to start shooting guys with beards and robes who, who, who come into their neighborhoods. It could happen, and it's exactly what happened actually in Anbar, where the Anbaris align themselves with the U.S. Marines to get rid of al-Qaeda. Um, we have to, I can't, it's very hard for me to, in a, in a couple of sentences, tell you here's what, yeah. the one thing we can do and it'll all be over with. We have to understand that there is a global revolution taking place. There is a network of, of groups that are anti-American, anti-Western, violently anti-Semitic, genocidal, and also trying to wipe out any diversity and, and, and within, the, within the Islamic world. They're trying to say that we, have to, we, we all need to join together to rise up against the Judeo-Christian empire and bring it down. We have to understand this and formulate a coherent strategy and the policies that go with it to defeat those who call themselves our enemies because they're very serious about this. And Cliff, I think you said it all in the sense that you can't give a one-word answer. You can't give necessarily a five-minute answer because we are dealing with a complex problem, but one that you've talked about and you've used the word a number of times, strategy. So do we have a strategy to fight the war that we're in today? Does President Obama have a strategy? We definitely, I would say, do not. We, it's, he's, in, he's called this overseas contingency operations. He talks about the different wars we're fighting as if they're unrelated. Um, there, is no, there is no sense that there is a global alliance against whom we need uh, an, an overarching strategy to fight a war of ideas. We have sanctions against Iran. That's great. Have you heard one speech by the president about what those sanctions are meant to achieve, telling the Iranian people what, why he is doing this, that this is not directed against them, but against their rulers who are genocidal, who are oppressing them, who are the leading sponsors of terrorism around the world? We, we do not have a strategy because we do not have a conception of this, if you looked at on 9/11, one of the things that disappointed me most, and I'm going to look into this more and probably <laughs> write about it soon, is we had a, memorials for the victims. That's wonderfully appropriate. We talked about the first responders and how grateful we are with them. That's right too. We saw, I saw nothing about who it was, the, who was the enemy who struck us on that day, what are his beliefs, what are his associations. It is different from VE Day or VJ Day because this war is still going on. What happened on 9-11 didn't end on 9-11. It's still taking place. And we've been reminded of that by what's happened in Libya and Egypt and Yemen and other places. This war is still going on in our media and in our government. There is no serious attempt to understand it or to come up with a strategy for defending ourselves from an enemy that is out to destroy us. It is just it is really astonishing when you think of it that way. And it doesn't matter... Uh if it's Ronald Reagan who dealt with the Marine, 241 Marines being slaughtered, or it is Jimmy Carter pre previous of uh, losing Iran, if you will, by not backing up the Shah, 
So as we see this, this is not about R's or D's. It's about a strategy and formulating that, but it starts with identifying the enemy. And I've identified the only problem with my program. I don't have enough time <laughs> because I want more time with Cliff May. Cliff May, president of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. We look forward to the article uh, when it comes out, and I'll be harassing you for more time with you. Thank you for making time for us tonight. Thanks, Thank Chris. you. Take care. Cliff